let me introduce Nicholas Brand with Lakestar, just right there. Hello. Partner with Lakestar. Trent McConaughey. Yep. Uh, with uh, Ocean and uh, a Big Chain DB in the middle here. And Hello. next to him is Sasha Borovic uh, with a cryptology, cryptology. It's cryptology. Cryptology, of course it is. Um, and Mike Butcher from TechCrunch. I'm the editor at large um, in, based in London. So um, this is a very general uh, title for a panel, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. But what we're going to do is we're going to uh, just write, basically have a kind of a, a rant and a, a riff, shall we say, about these, these subjects. Um, one of the things that's going on right now is you, sir, are going to, apparently, you know, there was a lady uh, walking around uh, the other day with uh, a t-shirt that said, venture capital is dead. Sure. As a venture capitalist, how dead do you feel at this point? So first off, congrats for being here. There's a panel in the other room about football. Now in terms of what might impact the future, you're setting the right priorities to listening to us. And I think VC them is dead. Part of it for sure is, because a lot of providers of VC money they bring down their core value proposition to one thing only, and that's providing the capital. And if that's it, I'd be a bit nervous, right? But at the end, what are we doing at Lakestar? We're business builders. We help our entrepreneurs transition from one phase of the company to another, right? So that was a marketing bit about Lakestar. But at the end, if you're only focused on creating value by giving capital, you're dead in water. There's more things to it. There's network, there's business building. There's business design. So I feel reasonably comfortable there's a role for us, even in the years to come. Right? I mean, um, what, um, Trent, what year is it in crypto right now? It, if you think in terms of the internet, development of the internet, you know, when uh, the web browser first was invented uh, by Tim Berners-Lee, um, what year is it where, where we are right now? Where do you think? I would guess probably somewhere along the lines of 1996, 97, somewhere in there. You know, it's after the Netscape IPO, after a few other the early IPOs, but the technology is still pretty immature, and you know, we've only really seen sort of one percent of the potential benefit so far, right? I think you know, crypto so far has only disrupted a couple industries. You know, um, VC it's been starting to disrupt that, and it's starting to dis disrupt um, gold with e-gold, Bitcoin. Um, a lot of the other stuff, there's a lot of promise, um, some r nice applications coming down the pipe, but none of it has really gone mainstream yet. So we're at the very early stages of you know, rewiring our planet. Well, someone said to me it was more like 1993. Would you, you think it's 1996? Yeah, I mean, the money has started to flow in, right? So certainly post Netscape IPO. OK, let's pop that and come, come back to that. Um, Sasha, let's, let's, so let's, let's now go through what you guys are actually doing. Sasha, what is cryptology? Uh, cryptology is a, an investment group that has uh, several capacities. One is we advise mature companies and startups uh, how to implement blockchain technology, how to introduce um, crypto tokens, how to tokenize assets, how to tokenize uh, securities in the company, if that's the road that the company wants to take. So that's what we advise. And then as, as we're doing that, we also take position in uh, these crypto assets, whether it's tokens or it's cryptocurrency or whatever that could be. Do you take normal fiat currency, currency as well? Uh, that we can do as well. Uh, but that's not what the companies normally would have. The usual story would be that you structure a fundraising for a startup company, which would be issuing either utility tokens or security tokens. And then you, like an investment bank, you take a bit of a commission for helping the company to develop that business model. Right. Um, what's Ocean? Trent. Oh. Uh, Ocean is a protocol that we are developing, uh, BigchainDB and a company in Singapore called DEX. And it is designed to erase and erode the data silos that we see on the internet today, the, the silos of you know, the Googles and Facebooks of the world that 
are threatening um, to you know, a positive future for society. So Ocean is designed to incentivize folks to share data, um, yet retain privacy. Uh, with very specific applications too, things like uh, self-driving cars where the Toyotas and the, and the Daimlers of the world can be sharing their self-driving car training data so that they can actually ship self-driving cars that are safe sooner, or medical healthcare data. So to, summary, to summarize, uh, Ocean is you know, a, um, a tokenized ecosystem that we're building right now towards uh, sharing incentivizing of data, um, espe especially within um, an AI training context. You don't think Google and Facebook have the best interests of society at heart? Well, they have their, the best interests of shareholders at heart, right? Um, and you know, there's many visionaries within Google and Facebook and the employees, um, and I think they built wonderful businesses, but uh, ultimately they are optimizing for the value of their shareholders, right? And we see that uh, why not have all the fish swim in, swimming in the same direction towards optimizing of the value of the token holders, which is the community, you know, AI researchers, uh, individuals with their own personal data, um, and so on. Tra uh, Nicholas, there's an enormous amount of bullshit in this space, right? Um, exactly how much bullshit is there in this space right now? Well, it's Can a you question. quantify it? 11. 11 what? 11. So Out I think 10? Now I think if you look at the ICO hype right now, it's insane, right? I think. Ethereum alone went up 100x over the last 12 months. That's unforeseen returns in where we come from in, in our industry. And every man and his dog, of course, is now figuring out how do I slash blockchain onto something that I'm doing. There's a British company called Online PLC. I think it's a rubbish business, about $3 million market cap. They changed their name into Online Blockchain PLC, and their share price quadrupled in a matter of hours. Still similar, same rubbish business. That's similar to the uh, uh, Ice-T blockchain company. Ice-T blockchain company, there's more of those. At the end... And Kodak. Kodak. <laughs> Kodak blockchain, indeed. Yeah, another great example. They didn't change the name, they just introduced the cryptocurrency. But, you know, it's, it's our job, the four of us, to help kind of separate the wheat from the chaff in what's going on right now and help you guys and everybody that's interested in it single out the projects which turn into something eventually that is used by, used by real world people like you and I, or real world enterprises. So we all need to do that together. How do you actually do that though? When you do, you're, you're in charge of Lake Star's investments into this space. How do you sort the wheat from the chaff? How do you tell what's good and what isn't? Well, it's a whole new discipline that some of which is very similar to what we've done in the past. How do you assess a business? How do you assess teams? There's a new discipline coming out that has to do with token economics, cryptography, a lot of the work that Trend and, and you will be experts in on how do you design decentralized infrastructures. That is a different, mind, a different mindset required. A business is a centralized entity. A decentralized protocol is something totally new. So I find myself in meetings quite frequently where the entrepreneurs make my brain sweat because it's so radical and so different from what we all know today. And these are the great meetings. I enjoy it. And Sasha, aren't you just, uh, in, uh, to use the British phrase, uh, putting lipstick on a pig right. by um, uh, helping these companies right. tokenize their assets? You know, I, I started my career in Palo Alto in the 90s, and I remember representing a venture fund when uh, one startup company came to pitch, and they said, we're looking to introduce internet to ordering pizza. And the VC laughed and said, this is bullshit. No one's going to order pizza using the internet. You guys uh, are out of your mind. Me. And then years later, uh, you do everything on the internet. You date, you um, buy pizza, etc. What you see with blockchain is, indeed, many people are bringing blockchain to projects where there is no room for the blockchain. You need to go through your checklist to see, do you need a ledger? Do you actually need smart contracts there? Are they parties really having diverse interest? Does this need to be transparent? So you go through all those questions, and if the answer is yes, you experiment. And you experiment the same way you experimented in the 90s with the internet. Many date sites 
collapsed, before Facebook appeared, or date sites that we know now appeared. And now we don't do many things that we did in the 90s without using the internet. And this is exactly the stage that we're going to now. And I'm saying, when I approach a startup company or existing company, I say, go and experiment. No one knows what will happen, but something will. And there is a saying that uh, pioneers take errors and settlers take the land. So right now it's a time of pioneers. Pioneers are exploring. And then somewhere there, there are settlers. You can call it lipstick on a pig or whatever that is, but something will appear. And that is what cryptology is building on. We have two Munich companies, for example. One is Cloudio. They're experimenting with putting on blockchain exchange of geodata and geoinformation. Very interesting company. And the other is JDC, one of the biggest insurance players in Germany. So we'll see where they land, but it's interesting. Their white papers are interesting. You can argue about it. You can dispute. The community is very open. I see some faces I recognize from meetups in Munich that take place. You go, they will be brutal on you. If your concept is bullshit, they will call you bullshit. Um, Trent, you're also doing something called Big Chain DB. What, what is that and what problem is it solving? Yeah, so a uh, bit of background. For about 15 years, I did AI. And then on the heels of that, uh, almost 20 years, uh, on the heels of that, in 2013, we started one of the world's first blockchain um, companies called Ascribe. And this was um, solving a, an elephant in the room problem for the art world, where the question was, how do you collect digital art? And um, we solved it. We built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, we worked closely with artists and galleries and so on. But then we ran into issues of scale. Uh, by mid-2014. And we looked around, and you know, we talked to our friends building the various uh, blockchains, the Ethereum folks, et cetera, and none of them were really thinking about scale. And we're like, we need this. Uh, we see that there's obviously these web companies that have got to scale like crazy, the Googles, the Facebooks. How do they scale? They have this idea of distributed databases, right? Where as you add more hardware, you add more nodes, these things hold more and more capacity. They have higher and higher throughput. Um, whereas with the world of uh, Bitcoin, people were saying that it's bloated, even though it only holds 50 gigabytes, which is like, I can hold that much in a thumb drive, right? So why is a block blockchain bloated if it's only holding as much as a thumb drive, right? Is that truly a global um, you know, changing network? And so with BigChain, we said, let's leverage all this awesome technology that has been developed in the distributed systems world over the last several decades, and then add blockchain characteristics, the things that make blockchains interesting, decentralized control, immutability, the idea that it, you're etching into stone once you've written to it, and the idea of assets, that you can claim assets, you can claim digital art, you can transfer assets, and it's all bound by this cryptographic digital signature. So that's what BigChainDB is. So it's taking, it's actually wrapping MongoDB, one of these best-in-class databases, and then bringing blockchain characteristics together. Why? Initially, to solve our own problem, a scribe. But of course, as we started talking to friends, they're like, hey, can I use that too? Can I use that too? So BigChainDB now, there's dozens of companies building world-class applications on top of it. And uh, you know, the full evolution, as we were doing this, talking about folks with um, data and so on, this is actually what led us to Ocean. So seeing that these data silos existed, we had already been playing in the data space, the blockchain space, tokens, um, talking about that. So it was a natural evolution. So now we are doing both Ocean and BigChain. And how are you funded? Do you, have you done an ICA? Uh, so BigChainDB is VC funded. Uh, you know, um, I've done three startups and have good relations with uh, the VCs that I've worked with over the years. And you know, they've made money from my company, so that's that's a good thing. So happy about VCs. Appreciate um, it. Yeah. And um, and at the same time, uh, we see that um, the funding models of the future are towards tokens and this sort of thing. And there's a lot of value in tokens for for the public nets in particular use cases. So with Ocean, you will be seeing more about the the, the tokens um, and Ocean in the future. What are some of the, let me just ask a general question to you guys. What are some of the real world applications that just the average person could get their head around, the, the best ones that you've seen? Or is it so early? Uh, you were talking earlier, um, Trent, about you wouldn't walk up to someone in the street and talk to them, suddenly start talking to them about MongoDB. So why would you talk to them about uh, Big Chain DB? But in terms of, real-world applications, what are some of the best ones you've seen? Are there any, or are we still really kind of in an infrastructure phase here? I would name two. I would say, I mean, you can name more, but I would name two just as an example. I would say, look, Ethereum is very interesting because it no, but, allows I mean, you... No, real-world applications. Well, you, you may develop... Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm talking about real-time applications. You, you can do smart contracts on that, which allows you to actually computerize, put into cut, 
coat, whatever. Okay, what's an example of a so, real so world that, smart contract? Well, contract that you buy something from me, yeah. we put it okay. on the computer what's code, that's, that's it. What's running right now? The second would be Steam it, and Steam it is like Facebook, except that in the context of Facebook, where individual data costs, say, 100 bucks per person, and they transfer that value to the shareholders of Facebook. In the case of Steam it, they say, Personal data is worth around 100 bucks, but we transfer that value in the community like Facebook, we transfer the value to individual users, bloggers, contributors to the network. And if it picks up, basically, right now from Facebook, I receive free service. That's what they give me in return. On Steemit, when you use the token, you actually, through the advertising, I am paid as an individual who Post the blog, people like it. Imagine I received 1,000 likes. Those 1,000 likes on the network are worth, so say, technically it's like, five bucks. It's like Medium, but you, got pay, you get paid. For example. You know, in Medium, you get claps. On Steam, it, you get their, their for, cryptocurrency. For example. Nicholas, would you, um, where would you, th do you, do you think we're in an infrastructure phase right now, where you're investing in infrastructure blockchain startups, <laughs> or, are you in or are there real world applications as well? Well, it's a perennial debate, real world I use mean, case, Steam. right? Let me ask a question to the audience. Who of you has knowingly used the TCP IP protocol? Uh, yes. No. So who of you has no. used one version of a blockchain? Any? OK, it was a bit of a trick question, because every single person in this room has used TCP IP. It's the protocol that governs how bits and bytes travel around the internet. In 10 years from now, 15 years from now, Blockchain will be all around us. Everybody in this room will have used it. Now, your question, Mike, is around where? Right? And I think, to me, it, it's helpful to understand what our forefathers of the internet gave us in terms of open source protocol. They gave us HTTP for websites. They gave us TCP IP for any type of bit traveling around, POP3 and all that for email. The US military gave us GPS, eventually for free. And there's two areas that are developing a lot of traction right now where our forefathers did not give us an open source protocol, and that's payment infrastructure. Right? Bitcoin is all about payment infrastructure. That is a real world use case that's up and running and that's live. And the second one is digital identity. Some of you might have heard Timothy Ruff speak about it this morning. And our IDs are centrally stored in different silos right now. Facebook, Google, Apple, we're not in control. So blockchain allows to bring control over that data back into our hands, and in a way that it's not owned by just a single corporation, but it's owned on a protocol that everybody can work with and everybody can use. So payment infrastructure and ID are the two areas I'm most excited about. Trent, have you got a view on this? Yeah, um, quite a few views. Uh, so thank you for mentioning the, the, the idea of identity, you know, and more broadly, it's the idea of sovereign personal data. You know. I control my data instead of giving it to Facebook, et cetera, letting them decide who sees it. I give them the keys. I give them permission. I can revoke that permission any time. That is fundamental, right? So this is coming. We haven't seen it hit the mainstream yet. Um, in terms of applications that are coming along, I'll mention a couple, and then also ones that are already there that have actually disrupted. So um, intellectual property is a big one. I mentioned Ascribe. Ascribe has been shipping in production since February of 2015. There's about 15,000 users, uh, more than 100,000 works registered. There are professional artists who use it to make a living. The National Gallery of Singapore has collected things, Mac Vienna, and others. Um, it's not for the average consumer because it's targeted for the art world, right? So that's something that we're very proud of. Um, but at the same time, we ran into the issues of scale, right? Um, another big one is actually supply chain. You know, you've, you're Daimler and you ha um, want to print a, a 3D part and have it um, sent to a dealer in Canada. By the time it arrives at that dealer, do you know that it's the real one or something fraudulent? But you can actually leverage blockchain uh, and supply chain technology together um, to, to make the provenance of that very, very um, trustworthy. So that's a, a very nice application that's coming down the pipe. There's uh, many others. I think also, though, I start with applications, and I up you on already changed the world. And I think there's a couple worth mentioning. I hinted before. One of them is um, uh, gold itself, right? So there's this ecosystem out there that's worth $200 billion to $500 billion already, depending on the value of Bitcoin. It's called Bitcoin. 
and it is a direct competitor to gold. And it has already been disrupting people who collect gold, et cetera. Um, so I think that's out there. And obviously, it's sparked many other things. But it's a real world application. It's a store of wealth that you know there's hundreds of billions of dollars of value there. So it's not a promise that's about to come. It's already there. The other one, which has already passed the promise, is this idea of the ICOs, the token launches, right? Um, last year, there was, you can correct the numbers, but uh, um, there was more money um, invested in ICOs, I think more than $3 billion, than in uh, early stage VC. I think that was about By $2 far. Billion. By yeah. far. Yeah, so this is something, it's not something that's going to disrupt. It has already disrupted, right? Um, a third one that's coming down the pipe um, very aggressively is Ripple with remittance, where it's um, wire transfers from one bank account to another. And Ripple has a way to do that. Obviously, they have a lot of value there. There's hype, but there's also some reality there. So those are some real world things that are, you know, in some cases already disrupted, and there's many other promising applications. There's one, one more, Mike. I think on that point, there's billions of money raised from ICOs these days. That means by now ICO litigation <laughs> is interesting, right? So there's a lot of people in the US looking at that. So much for smart, smart contracts and litigation. Um, one, of the real, one of the problems right now is that these um, blockchain companies are um, IC, doing these ICOs, initial coin offering. Some people actually call them initial community offering as well. Um, they issue a token, and then the token itself goes up in value. And instead of actually building an application using that token, which is kind of why the thing was invented in the first place, they are now trading the tokens on exchanges. John Evans wrote quite a good piece on TechCrunch recently talking about how this is actually kind of like an ice cap over innovation. So instead of these tokens actually turning into like the new wave of innovation that should be coming from this space, um, actually it's just turning into like another cryptocurrency. How are we going to break that logjam? And is, is the logjam going to be broken by a collapse in the price of cryptocurrencies, or what? Nicholas. It, it boils down to finding those people who are driven by more than f greed or financial, financial desire. So I respect everyone who raises 500 million and then still goes out and actually builds something. That's a mighty undertaking. You have to be driven by something else and not money. And it's kind of, we try finding those individuals and those teams, and, and they're hard to come by. And two, of, two of you, or if we, for you, Trent is next to me on stage. And these are the types of individuals we need to find and, and assess alongside these criteria. What are you driven by? Right. Um, does anyone have, you have uh, for now, it's a self-regulating industry. Uh, you pretty much know everyone who is someone in that space. They have a reputation. People who run ICOs, you see what they've done in the past. You can due diligence them. And um, I should say 98% of all the tokens that were issued this year, the price actually fell. And the reason why is because the teams uh, did a very poor job in crypto economics building the value into their tokens. And so trading of tokens as a way to support themselves is actually not uh, something that you see very much, primarily because the price of the 98% right. of tokens fell. Trent? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge diversity in the quality of teams, right? So um, because we've been in the blockchain space basically since the beginning, um, that, that, that's a community that knows each other. So um, I'm happy to you know, vet those people and so on. There are high quality teams that have only been around six months or less that emerge. And um, you know, if you have the technical capabilities, you can judge that. The average person on the street trying to invest in ICOs, um, it's tough, right? Um, so I don't really have great advice for that. Um, just try to get advice. I don't even talk, make friends with crypto people, I guess, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I'm very happy that regulations are coming. And there are best practices emerging, right? So like one thing that um, is from the startup space, the idea of vesting, right? You don't think the whole thing's going to start getting shut down by the SEC, et cetera? Oh, well, there already are things getting shut down, right? And this is healthy, right? And you know, regulations are coming. Um, you know, two years ago, there was not clarity, right? There was these ICOs. People didn't know if it was legal or not. But now we're seeing clarity from like Singapore, Gibraltar, et cetera. So all these things help. We, um, our time here was cut short because the, the, the schedule is overrunning. But in the last closing couple of minutes, I just want to quickly, you were a minister in the Ukrainian government uh, prior to this role. Yeah, I was, I was born in Ukraine and lived in the US and the UK for most of my life. 
And when uh, the war started in Ukraine, the revolution and stuff, I was invited, I was granted citizenship. I became the first deputy minister of economy of Ukraine during the war. Um, the, uh, it's, there, it's no accident that the recession and uh, the financial system collapsing in 2008 and 2009 and the, uh, and the Eastern Europe being in chaos to some extent, especially uh, given some of the governments who are floating around at the moment, um, that cryptocurrency has become massive, in, especially in emerging markets, and especially in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Um, and, and I know, that Trent, you've got views on this. What do you think, I know this is a terrible question to ask right at the end, but what do you think are the potential for the blockchain for, to produce better governance in societies? Well, there is an excellent paper prepared for the European Parliament on the policy for blockchain, where they go through about seven different models from elections to uh, IP registration. And that just basically demonstrates the power of blockchain that you can have such a diverse application and and bitcoin people need to remember is only one of them because uh, the most popular probably because of different noises but but blockchain has an amazing application wherever you have um, many participants that don't trust each other and can use a ledger that is public as i said from elections to ip registration rights trent i know you're working in this area as well yeah, so uh, a quick summary is you cannot have trustworthy govern governance without transparent governance. And blockchain technology can help to bring in transparent governance. Uh, also, there's a lot of experiments in blockchain on, on governance, and these learnings can be taken more broadly. Um, I'm very fortunate to iterate with governments like Estonia to help them thinking about tokens and embrace the future rather than kind of hide away in the corner and just regulate it away. So there is um, you know, forward-thinking governments thinking about this, as well as forward-thinking folks in the blockchain world thinking about governance. And um, blockchains are not just a technology. They're a chance to rewire society um, for a better way, sort of extending from the learnings of the internet, and we should embrace it. Well, tune in in a few years' time and see if it actually did rewire society. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Say hello. Thank you. Thank you for your time.